uh, with Deep Purple and a progressive rhythm and blues band, which is what I think uh, is needed at the moment. I think they decided after doing a couple of albums together, okay, let's put a band together. And at that point, Bernie had been playing with John Lord and Ian Pace in Pace, Ashman and Lord, and that had sort of fizzled out. So Bernie discovered that David was putting a band together and kind of decided to jump over to that. So it turned out that I was living fairly close to where Whitesnake were auditioning people. and. I think it's December 77, they, they had a drummer they wanted to audition but the bass player was busy that had already joined the band and so Bernie calls me up and says, oh can you bring your bass along and so I did and they were quite impressed but they already had somebody but he decided to leave a week or two later so that was just pure chance. A, knowing Bernie from before, and B, the guy deciding, oh, I think I'd rather stay with Frankie Miller Band. Or, you know, so he must have possibly been kicking himself eventually. Well, a lot of the media might have been banging on about punk. There was always a huge following for heavy rock. It was all going on, the kind of university circuit, small theatres, bands like UFO, Thin Lizzy, all of that kind of stuff. And Whitesnake fitted into that. That's where they went. They went back to playing the universities. Whitesnake were fairly pub rock to start with, really. Because you've got to remember as well, near the end of Deep Purple, they weren't playing the biggest venues, although they're a legendary band. If you look at tour dates from some of the last tours they did, and they were for, they were playing sort of provincial halls in England. They weren't doing, you know, just four nights at Wembley Stadium. It was very much running down a bit, really. When Snakebite came out, that got to number 61, and that was a, a pretty solid showing. It um, showed that it, it had been accepted, at least by the rock audience. Nobody really saw the success coming for White Snake. I, mean, I think you, you could back David Coverdale to make it, having been in Deep Purple, but they were fairly unexceptional records, the first few. It was very gratifying to be part of something that started really pretty small, with nobody very interested. You know, we had to trade on the X deep purple factor of David. None of the rest of us were known particularly. And, and for it to be less of David's backing band, as it were, it became a proper band within a, quite a short space of time. And that's what he wanted, you know. He didn't want uh, just a bunch of session guys behind him. Or he would have used the blokes from the albums that he'd made already, the, the, the session guys from that. The sound of the EP was, it was definitely a move away from Coverdale's solo albums. It was more of a group feel, more of a band feel. What they had was this kind of heavy blues rock, um, big on the cliches, but also big on, on, on a lot of fun. You could see that Coverdale was developing quite a flamboyant persona with that, and uh, you know he was going to develop that even further one, once White Snake got underway. There ain't no love the heart of the city. Freedom of expression within the, the framework of uh, my snake is so rewarding, so healthy. Whereas with purple, we were, we were restricted by the dogma of deep purple, which was that no nonsense, uh, you know, e well, moody, you know, manic, depressive, hard rock or heavy metal, unfortunately. Purple, we had a hell of a lot of freedom of the uh, individual for solo expression which I thought must have been confusing on reflection to an audience. 
you know, when everybody's getting off on the solo mm -hmm. pieces, and there's no cohesion or whatever as a band. Whereas now within this band, we concentrate on songs and solos within the songs. Songs that are built around the musician, uh, but the audience can identify and dig the, the expression of the, the soloist within the context of the song. Mm -hmm. uh, rest my case. Ain't No Love in the Heart of the City was the first White Snake classic. It's not their song, it's an old blues song. But they took it, put it on the Snake by DP in 1978, and it became an instant live masterpiece. So Ain't No Love in the Heart of the City was the first true classic White Snake song. David suggested doing a cover of a Bobby Bland song. Bernie started playing it and David singing it, and um, oh, it's good. And I inserted a little riff, which really I'd got from a Beatles song called Come Together. Dun, dun, doodle, dun. Of course, it, it became like an anthem for, for Whitesnake, but we never wrote it. Ain't No Love in the Heart of the City was basically White Snake's signature tune in the early years, and still to this day, um, a song just immediately associated, even though it's not one they wrote, um, it's one that you immediately associate with, with, with White Snake and Coverdale's voice. And Coverdale used to be able to sing it fantastically. Your jaw would hit the floor, it was breath, take your breath away. It's just desolate if you listen to it, 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 it chills you. <laughs> I think they were probably very encouraged that they had. Um, a, a, a sort of trademark song, uh, guaranteed crowd pleaser. So early on in their career, it was something by which they could be identified very quickly. Come on, let me hear you sing it from your soul. Sing it! The sort of chorus section of that was picked up one night in the City Hall, Newcastle. They started singing the chorus so loud that we just stopped playing and let them get on with it, and then that would you know you'd see how much how many times they would go around before you got really fed up and brought the song back in all the artists i was listening to like black artists you know feeling artists you know while i was experiencing exactly the same feelings you know i could relate to them and do them in my own way rather than copy somebody else you know you don't have to be black to feel what you're doing you know the only experience that they have an advantage, if you could call it that, is the fact that they were born in ghettos and things, but that, you know, like I was born on a council estate, which is like, uh, which is like a, a smart ghetto, if you like, you know, in England, there's many of them. The, the, the like, you know, you have huge apartment blocks over here with people sandwiched together. Well, these are flat, you know, right. like condoms, is it? Condominiums. Oh, condominiums. <laughs> <laughs> but is your mind on, boy? Something like Coverdale was a man who grew up on kind of classic rock and roll, classic blues, soul. I mean, this is where Coverdale's influences come from, you know, a black, a black soul singer. So there's a big element of that. David Coverdale used to sing with a lot of soul, and so, so from, the, from the end of Deep Purple to the early White Snake, yes, he, he was a reasonably soulful singer. Certainly more soulful and, and, and tuneful than a lot of the real heavy metal screamers. John. What's the reason why you became a member of Whitesnake? It was two years uh, since Deep Purple finished, and I only did a few things, and I was getting a bit bored, and I needed to work, and I heard David's music, and it sounded great, so I, it seemed like the right thing to do. About the music, what's about the music? Uh, you made hard rock today. Will you make in the future, perhaps, uh, experiments? Uh, 
Yeah, whoa. 